Uh, just to mention that the book that he mentioned from Ignatius Press is in fact published, Why Humanae Vitae is Still Right, which George Weichel said should have been entitled Why the Truth is Still True, which is kind of fun. And Angela and Franke has an essay in this book, so um, just to let you know that we don't have copies here, but you know they're easily available uh, online. I had a student, um, one of my former students was at an event last night, and he said I never should start a talk with what, what his favorite anecdote from my, my talks. Um, you know, when, there was, when I moved from, there's now been three versions of contraception, why not? And when I moved from the, the first to the second, one of my fans had gone through them and he said, you had 88 jokes in your first one. And he said, you've dropped 10 of them and you've added like, like 15. But it was just so funny having someone um, <laughs> catalog these. And now you may have heard this, but it's in old, jo old jokes are the best. My talk, Contraception, Why Not, uh, some many years ago, I was uh, speaking to one of my godsons who told me that when he misses me, he watches my video called Contra Contractions, Why Not? <laughs> right? So uh, a boy who was eight and the oldest of five who has heard what contractions five minutes apart and three minutes apart mean, so he, he knows more about contra contractions than contraception. And then a couple years later, I was giving a talk in Trinidad, and at the end of my talk, I was asked if I thought um, rapists should be castrated. And my knees buckled, and I thought, oh my gosh. I said, I said I, I, I've never been asked that question. I haven't really thought about the problem. I've heard there's drugs that can be used um, to, be, to control the sexual desire. Maybe that should be explored. And the next day, I'm leaving Trinidad, and I'm at a counter buying something. I noticed that National Newspaper of Trinidad has the title, uh, Castrate Rapists, says U.S. Professor. <laughs> And then my knees really buckled, and I said, I sure hope there's some other U.S. professor in Trinidad this, this weekend. <laughs> so I just want you to know you can look forward to my three-part series of talks. Contraception, why not? Contractions, why not? Castration, why not? <laughs> there's not too many people that can tell that joke or story, and it really it is, it is, it is a true story. All right, this is the 50th year anniversary of Humanae Vitae. And I, by my count, there's been somewhere between 35 and 40 conferences uh, held in the United States about Humanae Vitae. Not very many other places. And sadly, of course, not, I don't, maybe I shouldn't say of course, but not in Rome, right? No 50th, huge 50th year uh, celebration of Humanae Vitae. The United States is in pretty good shape. I mean, it always could be in better shape, obviously, but the number of, of bishops who are on board and the, the number of family life offices that are on board, the number of religious orders that are really teaching us, uh, and maybe most importantly, the number of seminaries that are now uh, promoting this is really much, much greater than it was um, 25 years ago and certainly uh, 60 years ago. But the world is still in sad shape, and when I say good shape, you'll see a little bit about it, but it's certainly not, it's better shape, I'd say, than we, we were. We've got a long way to go. So the document came out in uh, 1968, and it really was explosive. Uh, it's a little bit of an older crowd today, though still I'm probably one of the oldest in the room. Uh, I, was 19, I was 18 in 1968, and it didn't really impact me at the time. I wasn't aware of what was going on. Um, in the church, but as when I went back to look at it later, I realized that it was explosive, as was the year 1968 uh, in general. Uh, when it came out, this was the cover of Time magazine, and you'll see the um, banner across it. it says "Rebellion in the Catholic Church." And some of my students are very disturbed at what has happened both in the culture and in the church in the last year. Uh, what has happened with the sex abuse case is really unparalleled. It's one of the biggest crises the church has ever faced. But before even that happened, the parallels between 1968 and 2018 are pretty uh, remarkable. And I always tell them, you know, it's for me, it's deja vu all over again, right? It's so many similar things. And we had, we have all this rioting, this Antifa rioting in the streets, etc. Well, we had that in 1968. There were constant um, riots by the SDS and all sorts of, of radicals. Um, there was the assassination of Dr. King and uh, Robert Kennedy in 1968, and of course the uh, assassination of John Kennedy four years earlier 
my generation was beginning to think if you became a, a leader in the United States, you were very much possibly the subject um, of assassination. Um, we had, again, a lot of rioting in the streets, protesting against the Vietnam War, burning uh, draft tickets, uh, um, draft, whatever you call them, um, your draft card, there you go. I mean, killing uh, on TV, we'd see this as much as we've seen uh, the executions by um, Muslims and riot, uh, protests at, at the Olympics uh, for civil rights saying this is, we see all of these right now in our culture, and they were very active in 1968. We had uh, Gloria Steinem, whose famous statement was, a woman needs a, a man as much as a fish needs a bicycle. Um, um, so, I mean, we see this now, this incredibly feminism that, that hates men, right? And just uh, thinks, again, we just saw the Kavanaugh trial, that all you have to do is accuse a man. You don't need any evidence or any proof to to make your case. Uh, incredible uh, demonstrations in 68 to start making uh, abortions legal. We had all these um, bra burnings that now seem tame in comparison to the, I hate to say the word, the pussy marches that we now have. Right? Uh, it's just, it's, it's gross. Right? There's no dignity uh, in the whole thing. But this was all true in 1968. And the, uh, the book, The Population Bomb, uh, was, was published in 1968. Already in, in the 60s, there was a huge concern about the world being overpopulated. And uh, nobody's been proven to be more wrong in his predictions than Paul Ehrlich. But his thinking has dominated um, the higher echelons in the culture for, uh, for decades. Right? So much in, we thought the world was going to come to a crashing halt because of too many people. Now we're just in a kind of a panic about climate change, right? And so young people think that, and we're just ruining the environment so much that there will not be a world in the future. So that, again, the kind of pessimism that we had in 1968 about the fate of the, the world uh, is paralleled uh, today in certain respects. And we had some pretty tame, wild music. <laughs> might remember, you remember, might remember uh, Elvis Presley. I actually sort of remember it when Elvis Presley was on the Ed Sullivan show and was, they would only show him from the waist up because of the gyrations that, that he would do with his hips. And then, the, of course, the Beatles, because they had long hair. And, of course, a certain association with, with drugs were considered to be wild. Now they're considered to be family-friendly <laughs> entertainers. Um, there was this incredible change in fashion. Uh, from maxi skirts to mini skirts, and that's a mini skirt, which is hilarious. Um, uh, <laughs> it's, it's downright modest at, the, at, the, at this moment. Um, and of course, we had these great you know, drug fests and love fests all over the place. Now, again, I was, 19, I was 18 in 1968. I was a um, college freshman. And my uh, introduction sort of into the whole life issues happened in, in 19. 69, uh, when the, I was at Grinnell College in Iowa, which was a very radical school at the time, very radical. We had the first female um, homecoming, first male um, homecoming queen. My parents actually came out for homecoming. I, I've never liked football, but I would, they wanted to come. So we went and they crowned a man the homecoming queen. And my parents were just so disoriented. I mean, it's like, you know, where, where have we sent our daughter uh, to school? And there was actually a, a protest against Playboy magazine, a protest against Playboy magazine that was accomplished by like, I don't know, a dozen or so men and women um, stripping and sitting in a, a student lounge for a period of time. It would certainly make you disgusted at the human body and if that was what was meant to be done, um, <laughs> maybe that was the purpose of it. My, my parents would hear this stuff and of course like, what have we done, where have we sent our daughter? Which was a good question. I, I, they didn't send me there, of course, it was, it was my, my choice. I wanted to go to a radical school until I found out what radical meant. I remember sitting at an SDS meeting, the Student for a Democratic Society, which was a very radical group. I had no idea what this stuff was all about. And they were just tirading against um, policemen, right, that they're pigs. And I'm sitting there thinking, you know, my, my grandfather was a dock policeman. I said, he certainly wasn't a pig. You know, and then they were talking about identifying with the worker. And of course, they've all got this long, straggly, dirty hair and dirty clothes. And I'm thinking, my working class family would not identify with you people at all. Uh, you, and you don't identify with us. And it really was a huge change in my perspective. These people don't know what they're talking about. 
when they're talking about the uh, working class and, and policemen. But there were a group of women came to campus who were trying to liberalize the abortion laws in Iowa in 1969. And I was 19, and I had never heard of abortion before. It was possible in 1969 for a 19-year-old not to have heard of abortion. That's how amazing it is. And I went to the library uh, on my way to the meeting, and I looked it up, and I was shocked because my mother had babies when I was in my teens, and I just loved babies, and I couldn't believe women would do this. And um, it said the Catholic Church was opposed to abortion. Now, I'd left the church for about a year, and I was kind of astonished at that because I'd never heard of abortion. And so I went to this meeting, incredibly honestly shocked with what I'd read, but still open-minded. And I got to the meeting, and I raised my hand, and I said, um, I said, what I need, we need to know is when human life begins. I just read that in the encyclopedia, so I'm sounding very knowledgeable. What we need to know is when human life uh, begins, because that will affect how we write these laws. I said, I'm here and I'm prepared to write letters, but I just want to know what we're asking for. When does human life begin? Obviously, once it begins, it deserves the protection of the law. And the group of women who were promoting abortion just started shouting at me, you know, um, you know sit down, shut up, we don't need your kind here. And now this is the next slide, you see. That was me in 1968. Now, everybody uh, at Grinnell College, men and women, were doing our best to look like John Lennon. And you see, <laughs> you, put, you put little wire rim, rim glasses on me and make my hair a little more straggly. I, I achieved it as much as anybody else. You know, I'm, I'm sitting there with some sort of work shirt and you know, jeans and combat boots, and I'm looking around the room. I say, you don't need my kind hair. I said, I've been... Doing, I'm thinking to myself, I'm doing my best to look like everybody else in this room, and I thought I had achieved it. So what is my kind? And they're saying, we don't need you right to lifers here. Well, of course, I'd never heard of right to life because I'd never heard of abortion. And so it wasn't too many months after that that I found myself being very pro-life, and I started going back to church because the Catholic Church was right about abortion. Because people would come up to me and they'd say, why are you against abortion? And I said, I don't know if I am, but I know the key question. And then it, as we talked, I just became more and more convinced that there were nowhere else to put where human life begins at a conception and just became a campus oddity um, as someone who was opposed to abortion and now was going to mass every Sunday. I'll tell you, there's nothing more quiet and dead than Sunday morning on a campus like Grinnell College, right? You see the five other people that are going to church and wave them as you walk across across campus. Sorry, that was my start. And then a couple years later, I uh, was at a graduate student at the um, University of Toronto, and I was with this incredible group of young people who had all become very enthusiastic about our faith, uh, reverts, converts, cradle Catholics. And we felt that since we were little intellectuals, we should be able to defend the church's teaching on everything. And we were first willing to take it just on the basis of obedience, because we had come to have great respect for what the church was. But we thought our job as intellectuals should be able to defend it. So we'd, we'd had a several reading groups. We had a Vatican II reading group. We had a Thomas Aquinas reading group. We had a um, pro-life group that I ran. And we had a Humanae Vitae reading group. And by the time we were done reading it, I was totally convinced that it was true and that I was prepared to defend it. And years later, I went to started teaching at Notre Dame. I started teaching at my classes and uh, got me in some trouble at Notre Dame. Uh, and I, um, some of my students went off to one of my colleagues and said, Professor Smith is teaching Humanae Vitae in her classes, and she's supporting it. Right? It wouldn't have been any problem if I'd been dissenting from it. The problem was I was supporting it. And I told the students in class, I said, how many of you, how many of you think the church's teaching on contraception is, is true? None of their hands went up. I said, how many of you have read Humanae Vitae? None of their hands went up. These are sophomores, it's not fair, but I don't mind being unfair to students. And, um, and then I said, how many of you have thought about it uh, for five minutes or more? And none of their hands went up. So they went out to tell this other, other uh, faculty member, my colleagues, that I was teaching it and promoting it. And he said, she seems intelligent. Um, he said, I don't, I don't see how she can hold that position. And so the students said, well, let's have a debate. So we had a debate two and a half weeks after uh, I first was teaching it. And I made the similar remarks that I just made here about nobody ever reading it and a dissent from it. And he had the great grace, honestly, to turn um, bright red. 
And he said, you know, I had not read the document until this afternoon. And though he and his wife had been contracepting for the last 15 years. And the students were stunned, of course, because they think faculty never hold a position that they haven't carefully considered. And they were still, they were shocked at, at dissent from the church. So all of a sudden I become the Humana Vitae lady. Um, and this was precisely at the time that John Paul II was you know, teaching theology of the body. And I, I had a, a colleague at Notre Dame that we were getting these things by faxes then from, from Rome. And they were being published in Observatory Romano and he would put them under my um, office door and I'd sort of whatever I was learning, I was teaching in class. And um, so my, my thinking about Humana Vitae was very much shaped by John Paul II's Theology of the Body as it was being um, distributed publicly. So that's just a bit of my background. That's the context of the encyclical itself. Um, the fact is that all uh, Christian churches were opposed to contraception until 1930, all Christian churches. I did an evangelical radio show the other day with Eric Metaxas, and it was so much fun saying that, you know, and that, that all Christian churches uh, have been opposed to contraception. And I think evangelicals, though, are, many of them are really reconsidering um, their acceptance of uh, contraception. Luther had some incredible things to say. I'd love to hear a pope speak like this. He says, the purpose of marriage is not pleasure and ease, but the procreation and education of children and the support of a family. Here's the part I like. People who do not like children are swine, dunces, <laughs> and blockheads, not worthy to be called men and women, because they despise the blessing of God, the creator and author of marriage. I love this, swine, dunces, and blockheads, right? <laughs> He says, the exceedingly foul deed of Onan, the basest of wretches, is a most disgraceful sin. It is far more atrocious than incest and adultery. We call it unchastity, yes, a sodomitic sin. For Onan goes into her, that is, he lies with her and copulates, and when it comes to the point of insemination, spills the semen, lest the woman conceive. Surely at such a time, the order of nature established by God and procreation should be followed. Accordingly, it was a most disgraceful crime. Consequently, he deserved to be killed by God. He committed an evil deed, therefore God punished him. This is Luther, right? So this is Luther's view of, of contraception. Gandhi was also opposed uh, to contraception. He said there can be no two opinions about the necessity of birth control, but the only method handed down from ages past is self-control. It is an infallible sovereign remedy doing good to those who practice it and medical men will earn the gratitude of mankind if instead of devising artificial means of birth control, they will find out the means of self-control, which is, of course, precisely what natural family planning uh, is. Right? He says, artificial methods are like putting a premium upon vice. They make man and woman reckless, and the respectability that is being given to the methods must hasten the dissolution of the restraints that public opinion puts upon one. Adoption of artificial methods must result in imbecility and nervous prostration. I think we see that among some feminists, huh? The remedy, will be, the remedy will be found to be worse than the disease. Now, this is Gandhi, right? not a Christian. But this was based on good common sense about the nature of men and women and what happens if you trivialize the sexual act by removing the possibility of procreation. Anthony Comstock was a Presbyterian minister, who was also a congressman, and he uh, had gone to New York City and saw terrible um, sexual license there. Lascivious dancing, pornography, promiscuity, and he believed it was because of the availability of condoms, basically. And so he had laws put on the books that were opposed to the selling and the distribution and the use of contraception. And all across the United States, there were laws against such. And they weren't overturned until the last ones were overturned in 1965. They were put on the books by Protestant legislators, right? And take, and defended by Catholics, uh, Catholics uh, bishops. Many bishops, bishops would uh, exchange uh, opinion col columns with Margaret Sanger on the pages of, of, of major newspapers. There's a wonderful story about uh, a group of Knights of Columbus who took a bunch of Boy Scouts to Albany to protest at the state capitol 
when New York State was thinking of liberalizing its laws on contraception. So the, the, the laws were put on the books by, by Protestants and very much kept on the books until 1965 with Griswold versus uh, Connecticut. Margaret Sanger, more and more people, are, I hope more and more people are coming to understand that she was an incredible racist and a eugenist, right? This is her words from her journal. She said, like the advocates of birth control, the eugenists, for instance, are seeking to assist the race, that's us, towards eliminating the unfit. That's also us, by the way. Both are seeking a single end, but they lay emphasis upon different methods. Eugenics without birth control seems to us a house built upon the sands. It is at the mercy of the rising stream of the unfit. Now, the unfit, in Margaret Sanger's view, were African Americans, blacks, and immigrants, which were mostly Catholics, right? She didn't want them around. She says the way that we eliminate the problem of poverty is we eliminate poor people. And the poor people were largely the, the um, blacks and immigrants, and that's still the case today, especially with the black community. One of the saddest parts of the whole contraception story and the abortion story is that so many Catholics have been uh, in the forefront of promoting contraception, promoting abortion, and now even same-sex uh, marriages. John Rock was a very famous doctor uh, who was one of, among those who uh, invented the contraceptive pill. And he was, at one point, a daily mass communicant, but he, he died with uh, very unstable <laughs> mental health. Uh, one of his granddaughters came to me when I was at Notre Dame. She was actually a member of Opus Dei and told me that the family was praying uh, for John Rock's soul, which I thought, how God protects us from ourselves <laughs> to give him such a, um, a granddaughter. But John Rock was certainly willing to do experimentations that he knew very well um, were abortifacient or killing babies in the womb, and that he wasn't troubled by that. His goal was to uh, find a way to help women uh, control their fertility. And the experimentations he did were in third world countries. The first experimentations done with the contraceptive pill were done in Puerto Rico, because Puerto Rico is obviously a very poor country, and it was Catholic. And he believed that he could, if he could get Catholics in a very poor country to accept contraception, we'd be home free. Right, the church would eventually change, change and accept uh, contraception. Problem was that three women died in the first test group in Puerto Rico. You can all find all of this, this incredible story, honestly, on, on the PBS um, website. And they, do a, they did a marvelous little video in the, in the, on the 40th year anniversary of Humanae Vitae. And most of the experimentation with uh, contraceptives are done in third world countries because the women are poor, uh, and if something goes wrong, they can't sue, right? They don't have the money to sue. They don't have the resources uh, to have recourse. So the John Rock just changed the, the, uh, the dosage of the hormones uh, to reduce the possibility of death. But we know women are still dying uh, from contraception. It's something's very quiet. It's kept quiet, but it's true. All right, so let's do a little something with church teaching here. Uh, the authoritative book on this is really by John Noonan, uh, who was in fact a marvelous pro-lifer, one of the best, uh, is written one of the best books on uh, abortion, but he was very much a, a proponent of contraception. And in 1964, he wrote this book, uh, Contraception. And it was very influential on uh, the culture and even on the church. Now, even though the book was written with the purpose of getting Catholics to accept the possibility that contraception, the teaching on contraception could change in a sense of be reversed. Uh, this is what he said in the first chapter, page six. He says, since the first clear mention of contraception by a Christian theologian, when a harsh third century moralist accused a pope of encouraging it, the articulated judgment has been the same. In the world of the late empire known, and then he names a number of saints in different areas of the the, the earth and the globe in different um, times in history, he goes on to say, the teachers of the church have taught without hesitation or variation that certain acts preventing procreation are gravely sinful. Right? So he's saying the church has always taught that contraception is wrong, all times and all places. And we know that that's one of the signs of the truly the infallibility 
of a teaching. It is taught at all times uh, and all places. But then he goes, and he goes on to say, he said, no Catholic theologian has ever taught, this was in 1965, no Catholic theologian has ever taught contraception is a good act. He says the teaching on contraception is clear and apparently fixed forever. Well, he puts a lot of weight on that word, apparently. <laughs> He's going to try to change our understanding of this. He thinks that, um, he thought that uh, we could change the teaching on, on contraception. He was a peritus, an expert uh, at the special commission that John XXIII set up and then Pope Paul VI took over on the question of birth regulation. I'll skip that one. Well, maybe I won't. I'll go back. Got ahead of myself. The Lambeth Conference, as I mentioned, is an Anglican conference that's held every 10 years when they're agreeing with each other. They canceled the last one because they're so bifurcated, um, trifurcated, multifurcated, polyfurcated. Uh, there's not much commonality in the um, Anglican communion these days. But uh, that was the first, again, church that, the denomination that accepted the churches, uh, that rejected the constant teaching against contraception. And it was not at all based on any new understanding of theology or scripture or anthropology. It was simply the pressures of the difficulties of having uh, many children. And it was a, a, it's a really very kind of pathetic uh, attempt to, there was no justification for the change. It wasn't really until 1958 that they even felt a need to start producing some sort of justifications. In 1930, Costi Knubi was issued by Pius XI, which is really a beautiful document on marriage. It's one of those things that could absolutely still be used for marriage prep. And it was Pius XII simply restating what the church's teaching had always been on contraception. And there was no debate on this issue up until the late 1950s, early 1960s within the Catholic Church. Catholics accepted it, all right, and lived it with some uh, pride. There's a book called... Uh, an American History, Catholics, and Contraception by a lady historian, Leslie Woodcock Tentler. And in this book, again, she's trying to make a defense for the church to change its teaching, but really she makes an incredible statement about how Americans did accept the church's teaching and that it was taught, it was taught by the church. That's what it hasn't been, as you know, for the last 50 years. But it was taught. It was, there were constant missions, uh, usually in Advent and in Lent. A group uh, a priest would come in to a, a, a dot, uh, parish and have several nights a week where they would uh, teach basic Catholic doctrine. And there would be one night of the week that was called the sex night, <laughs> where they would talk about cohabitation and fornication and contraception and masturbation and adultery and explain how these things were not in accord with church teaching. So Catholics were really quite remarkably well educated on this. As a matter of fact, in some dioceses, one of them was the Archdiocese of Detroit. Um, priests were expected, they had a syllabus of topics that they were supposed to cover during the space of a year. And they, um, contraception was on that list of topics that a, a priest was expected to preach on in the course of a year. So Catholics knew their church's uh, teaching. And as a matter of fact, she tells us that they really um, embraced it. She says, many laity admired their church's increasingly lonely defense, meaning other, uh, Protest other Christians, Protestants were rejecting it. Many lady re admired their church's increasingly lonely defense of a procreative sexual ethic. Many shared their clergy's anxieties when it came to emancipated views of sex. And a great many Catholics responded with a visceral surge of tribal loyalty. When public proponents of birth control attacked the Catholic Church, the story was one of idealism, too, especially after the Second World War, when the teaching was increasingly presented in personalist terms and in a context of national prosperity. I love this phrase, a visceral surge of tribal loyalty. I think that's in spite of what's going on with the sexual abuse crisis, I'm finding there is a visceral surge of tribal loyalty among Catholics now. We're not going to be run out of our own church, right? We are going to, to reform our church. Uh, one of my sisters is, is as outraged as I am about what's been going on, and she f says, I don't understand it. She says, but I'm realizing more and more that I love this church, and I'm not going to put up with this. So she went to, con she said, well, I better practice my faith better. So I she went to confession, and one of the things she confessed was, 
how angry she was at what was going on in the, in the church. And the priest tried to talk her down. <laughs> she was not to be talked down. <laughs> I think I told her there's going to be a sign out confessions today except for her. Um, and she said, oh, I'm going back a lot. I'm going to, I'm going to go back and I'm, 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 going to, I'm going to let him know what, what we're thinking out here. Um, so this was true about the church's teaching on contraception. I remember when I grew up in the 1950s and uh, really, we could, on a, in a small town in Pennsylvania, lower middle class, the whole neighborhood basically on the same page about everything. We were only, we were two, two Catholic families on the, on the street. Uh, everybody else had four kids, we had six. You know, it sort of seemed like four was what the, the Protestants were willing to have and uh, we had more. And it was just a sense of everybody loved children and everybody loved what would now become considered a big family to have more than three kids or, or more. But it was Catholics who were very proud that we just filled up a pew. Um, and yeah, my family had a, my parents were, had to be incredibly fr frugal uh, to support this family. We didn't have a lot of money. But we all knew that another baby was more important than anything else. You know, we didn't need a new car. We didn't need a bigger house. We were happy to have another, another baby around the house. Now, it, one very important book uh, in this whole story is Carol Wojtyla's book, Love and Responsibility that was published in the late 1950s. It's a beautiful book. I think it's actually one of the classics of uh, Western civilization. And this was you know, 10 years before Humanae Vitae came out, but he provided a very strong personalistic and natural law, uh, philosophical defense of the church's teaching on uh, sexuality and largely uh, contraception. It's an incredibly rich work that there's still treasures there to be uh, discovered. So it was on the heart of John Paul II long before Humanae Vitae came out, this 10 years earlier. Right? It was one of the passions of his life was to explain to people why the church's teaching on sexuality was, was true. So obviously there was some rumbling at the time. There were some, what are called, even revisionist theologians were kind of a, on a very theoretical level starting to challenge the church's teaching on universal norms, on the purpose of sexuality. Etc. Not not any big um, direct attack, but much more on fundamental principles. Uh, in 1962, the journal in the United States, Theological Studies, which is the professional journal for theologians in the United States, made this statement. 1962, um, and this was right when the contraceptive pill was being uh, invented, and there was a discussion in the Catholic circles about whether or not it. It came under the church's condemnation of contraception because up to that point there was only the condom and the diaphragm, and both of these were physical barriers in the sexual act. They were physically barriers to the semen being um, deposited in such a way that it could result in conception. And some people are thinking, well, since the pill is not a physical barrier, maybe it isn't in conflict with the church's teaching. Maybe it was just sort of controlling the time of fertility. And some people thought there was going to be a drug that a woman could choose which days of the month she wanted to be um, fertile. So if she was going on vacation, she could you know, push it one way or the other. But when theologians looked at it, they said, oh, no, no, the principles apply to, to the pill as well as other devices, and it's equally immoral. So in 1962, this journal says, since theological discussion of the anti-ovulant drugs began some four or more years ago, moralists have never been less than unanimous in their assertion that natural law cannot countenance the use of these progestational steroids for the purpose of contraception as that term is properly understood in the light of papal teaching. That's 1962. Now by 1965, the same journal told us that the, the teaching is now in doubt. It's in, in dubia. And there's so many people, um, but so many theologians are now challenging the church's teaching that it's no longer settled teaching, that, again, couples should be free to do what they, their consciences told them uh, about this. This is before Humanae Vitae. Now, Pope Paul VI, as I said, inherited a special commission on the question of birth regulation from John XXIII, who had six priest theologians who were a part of this commission, and they were going to address the question about how the church could teach its teaching in the modern world, because the, there were all these rumblings about overpopulation. And the UN was now um, proposing to hold uh, big conferences on overpopulation. Of course, they were going to be 
uh, promoting the pill. The pill was going to be, see to be, as it is still, seen to be the, the magic bullet to the world's problems. If we just got an effective contraception, what more problems would there be on the face of the earth, especially it would control overpopulation? Well, when he, that commission, I think, only met once and it barely got started. So when he died, Pope Paul VI took it over, and he put some 66 people on the commission, mostly uh, lay people, uh, family life office directors, leaders of family life movements, uh, demographers, sociologists, medical doctors, uh, and, of course, theologians. And that commission, uh, on which was, let's see what I have next, no, not yet, All right. uh, had a very famous dissenting theologian, not yet known to be dissenting so much, but Bernard Herring. And Bernard Herring convinced the group that they should change their mandate. It wouldn't be how the church should teach its teaching in the modern world, but whether the church could and should change its teaching. Right? Whether the church could and should change its teaching. So uh, there was a marvelous American Jesuit named John Ford, who was also on the commission. And he ran off to Pope Paul VI and said, you've got trolls on your hand here. You've got a group that is a runaway commission. And he wanted him to shut it down. But Paul VI said, well, we've got to let it take its course. And he, he tried to help out by sending over to Vatican II uh, Council, which was meeting at the time. He sent over certain footnotes that he wanted to put in the document, Gaudi et Spes, that would indicate what has always been the church's teaching on contraception. At the same time, he put another 15 members on this commission, which were all archbishops and cardinals, and made them the only voting members of the commission. He's trying to control this runaway commission. And unfortunately, uh, they, vote, they voted, I'll get to this, nine voted that the church should change its teaching, three voted that it couldn't change its teaching, and three abstained. So these were the cardinals and archbishops who voted that the church could and should change it's teaching. You'll find this whole story in this book, uh, Turning Point, by Robert McClory. Again, he was, he was the, I think, the editor of the National Catholic Reporter for a long period of time. And it's, um, he's all thinks the church should change its teaching, that the, the pope should have accepted the finding of the commission. But it's quite a story on how the commission uh, did its work. Um, these are the two certain top people. Bernard Herring from the start was a theologian who did not accept the church's teaching on universal objective norms. And Joseph Fuchs was a Jesuit who was, in fact, one of the best articulators of natural law and the church's teaching on absolute norms until the special commission. And he changed his mind. Uh, and he became a big supporter, uh, kind of a quiet supporter, but he was such a big man um, in, the, in, the, in the Jesuit order that his dissent just completely took over the Je Jesuits immediately. And the Jesuits have always been one of the orders that is most, most rejects um, humanae vitae. Go back just for a minute here. So in 1968, um, in 1960, they, actually the commission finished its work in 1966. And in 1967, somebody decided that John Paul the, I mean, Pope Paul VI wasn't moving quickly enough. So they leaked the documents of the commission uh, to a, a newspaper, in, a Catholic newspaper in France, and one in London, the National Catholic Reporter in the United States. Some big headlines, you know, the church's special commission on contraception votes that the church sh could and should change its teaching. Major theologians, they, these are the two top theologians in the world, right? The best theologians in the world were taught by Bernard Herring and Joseph Fuchs, right? They were the theologians teaching in the universities and teaching in the seminaries. And the minute that they rejected the church's teaching on contraception, basically, zoom, the academy and the seminaries lined up with Bernard Herring and uh, Joseph Fuchs. So poor Pope Paul VI had this, again, this huge public uproar that the church was finally going to come into the modern world and it was going to accept uh, contraception. And there he was, lonely old <laughs> Paul VI. Um, and what's interesting is that Carol Wojtyla, Archbishop of Krakow, was actually a member of that commission. Now, he was never able to get to Rome to meet with the, the commission, but he was getting their reports. And he put together his own special commission of five uh, theologians, one I think was a medical doctor, 
and they wrote an incredible report, which is actually published in this book, um, where he gives a very, uh, one, they give a very wonderful personalist and natural law defense of humanae vitae. And that was sent over to, um, this was before humanae vitae, the, uh, the church's teaching on contraception, I should say. So they sent that to, uh, Paul, he, to Paul VI, and it was a great influence on them in writing, writing the document. But that was 1968 then when, when the, the document came out, and it was just like, again, a bomb went off. The church said that the church's teaching on contraception is still true, <laughs> still right. And from that moment on, almost immediately again, seminarians became a place that, uh, well, let's put it this way, um, Father Charles Curran, uh, who was a young moral theologian at the Catholic University of America. You haven't seen him much lately. He used to be on the, the news all the time, all the time, uh, sort of explaining away the church's teaching on many matters, but especially contraception. He's written some 40 books um, on dissent, but he was a young moral theologian when Humanae Vitae came out, and he stood on the steps of the Catholic University of America and told um, Catholics that they did not need to abide by this teaching, right? that it was based on an inadequate notion of natural law and they could do what their consciences told them to on contraception. Uh, he got some, I think, almost at a certain point, 800 people, um, professionals in the church of some stripe, that signed a statement of dissent against Humanae Vitae. As I mentioned, the top teachers in the world from Rome all right, taught this and it spread all over the, the world. Cardinal O'Boyle in Washington, D.C., um, uh, was faced with a statement of dissent by 150 of his priests signed a statement of dissent against Humanae Vitae. And he suspended some of their faculties uh, trying to get them to recant. These 150 priests uh, protested and appealed to Rome, and Rome actually uh, made Cardinal Oboil restore their faculties. He didn't, he didn't defend the priests. They didn't defend the priests. You're saying, why? <laughs> what was happening there? They were actually afraid of a schism. They were actually afraid that the church was going to split over this. I talked about the parallels between 68 and now. There's been talk about the German church um, splitting from the Roman Catholic Church. When I was at Notre Dame in the 1980s teaching there, there was a lot of talk of schism, that eventually there would be an American Catholic Church and a Roman Catholic Church and a German Catholic Church, and we would have all these national churches rather than uh, a universal church over, initially, the question of contraception. Right? So the, the parallels are tremendous. Uh, and you'll notice in the last 50 years, you, I can count on two hands, uh, the number of homilies, maybe one, that I've heard on humanae vitae or contraception in my life. But most of them been in the last five years. Right? We get young priests who are willing to do this. We get some bishops who are, are really supporting the teaching. So it was the beginning of dissent on virtually everything in the church, contraception, masturbation, fornication, divorce, homosexuality, women, priests, and now everything, honestly. Uh, it all began with Humanae Vitae. The church before Humanae Vitae, I mean, there were rumblings, of course, of dissent, I've mentioned them, but the church before 1968 and the church after 1968 were radically different churches. And believe me, the church before 2018 and the church after 2018 are going to be radically different churches. All right, we're living in a time of what I hope is radical reform in the church. In 1968, we introduced radical dissent, and it has polluted the church for the last 50 years. And I think we are going to, if we lay people, if we lay people keep putting the pressure on, <laughs> that we will no longer tolerate um, priestly immorality and will no longer tolerate dissent uh, in the church, things will change. And as bad as McCarrick was, uh, what has happened with McCarrick has been the most fantastic wake-up call and galvanizing force for uh, Catholics to say, no longer, we've had it, we, it's not going to happen anymore. All right, Cardinal Schoenbern had some amazing things to say about Humanae Vitae. He said, Cardinal Schoenbern accused the signatories of a document against Humanae Vitae of weakening the peoples of God's sense for life. So when the wave of abortions and increasing acceptance of homosexuality followed, the church lacked the courage to oppose them. There were a few memorable exceptions in 1968, the cardinal said, one of which was in Krakow, where a group of theologians led by the archbishop and cardinal of Krakow, the future Pope John Paul II, drew up a memorandum which was sent to Pope Paul VI urging him to write Humanae Vitae. 
He said, those bishops, said Cardinal Schoenberg, were frightened of the press and of being misunderstood by the faithful. Blamely not only with the bishops responsible at the time, none of whom is still alive, but with all bishops for the fact that Europe is about to die out. I think it, that is also our sin as bishops, even if none of us were bishops in 1968, he said. Bishops have not had or did not have the courage to swim against the tide and say yes to humani vitae. We've all discovered something, I think, in the last, well, at least those of us who are obsessed with this, which I am, have discovered something in the last couple months, that this incredible presence of homosexuality among the priesthood has been a major obstacle to the teaching of humani vitae, right? And all the great programs that laity have been trying to put in place for the last couple decades, chastity programs, NFP programs, better curriculum in Catholic schools, have been stymied, all right, from people at the top, right? So we've been, we've been fighting hard for the truth, and we haven't had the support that we needed from the priesthood. And a lot of that is because of active homosexuality in the priesthood. If, if you, I've been rereading reading the books that were written, and I read most of them at the time, in the, in the 80s and the 90s, and certainly around in the early 2000s, that were exposing uh, the, the um, prominence of homosexuality in the seminaries and in the priesthood, especially in the 1980s, it was unbelievable. Now, I read those at that time, and I just accepted it, that this is somehow the reality in which we live. And now nobody's, we're not, I mean, not nobody, but I'm not accepting it anymore, all right? I'm going to scream as loud as I can uh, everywhere I can to say this has got to stop. Right. So Schoenberg's right, the dissent from Humanae Vitae was major, but the reason people were dissenting is, the priests were dissenting is because they weren't living the church's teaching themselves. And you can't promote something that you're not living. Right? And I, I'm not, I don't want to paint all, ever, all priests with this. I mean, there are obviously many beautiful, wonderful priests who bring us the sacraments and we adore them in their fidelity. They have been persecuted by this. Right? They are victims of his descent as well as us. So Schoenberg says about Boitio, he says, I think this witness by a martyr bishop of the so-called silent church carried more weight than all the expertise Pope Paul VI had drawn up on this subject. It led him to make his courageous decision. I'm convinced in my inner being, even if I have no historical evidence, that this text from Krakow helped to give Pope Paul VI the courage to write him on Evite. Although Pope Paul VI Blessed Pope Paul VI wrote Manavite. In a certain sense, it's John Paul II's document. Right? He had a great influence in the content of it, and he spent his pontificate defending it. Okay? So, in a way, and providing a better defense than can be imagined. I'm going to have to go a little bit faster here, but this is Cardinal Stafford who talked about when Manavite came out. There were riots on the street, um, racial riots on the street in Baltimore, and he was a young priest, and he talks about a priest of the diocese calling all the other priests together in the basement of one of the major churches and telling them, asking them to sign a petition against Humanae Vitae, right? And they went around the room, and he was the last one in the back of the room. Nobody had read the document, right? Nobody knew what it said, and they were being this pressure to sign this statement of dissent. He says the only, he was the only one that didn't sign it. And he said, from that day, he said, there was a bifurcation in the priesthood from which we have not recovered. He said, before that, if a priest saw another pri a priest with a call, you're on the same team, right? You're on the same team. And now they were wary of each other, right? We're no longer brother priests. We're fighting different battles. You're promoting contraception. I'm not, right? We're no longer on the same team. So a um, great book that writes about all of this is what went wrong with Vatican II by the late, great Ralph McInerney. Um, he doesn't think anything went wrong with Vatican II. He's all about how Humani Vitae, the descent from Humani Vitae, made people reject Vatican II. There's lots of good news. The good news is John Paul, was John Paul II, right? Of all the people on the face of the earth that the Holy Spirit could have chosen, John Paul II, only 58, only 58, all right, was chosen in 1978, 10 years after Humanae Vitae, to be the Holy Father. Now, he was fantastic on human dignity and on uh, fighting against communism, a major source of, of the fall of communism. But he had a passion for the church's teaching on sexuality. And if a whole, and the Holy Spirit wanted to find someone who had a passion, he was the best person on the face of the earth 
able to defend the church's teaching on sexuality. We got the right man for the job at that time. Of course, his theology of the body is incredible. He got great resources in the Philadelphia area about the theology of the body. Here he intended, and he did, provide a scriptural basis for the church's teaching on contraception. All of the theology of the body is to defend humanae vitae, right, on the basis of scripture. Love and responsibility was philosophical. This is theological. His teaching shows up in the wonderful documents, Familiaris Consortio, Catechism, Veritatis Splendor, Evangelium Vitae. These are storehouses of wisdom that are phenomenal, and they have all over them the fingerprints of the thought of John Paul II. If you want to talk about some really unbelievably beautiful developments of church teaching, John Paul II provided those with his what's called his phenomenological personalism. We now talk about the sexual act as meant to be an act of complete self-giving. That's John Paul II's language and tons of stuff that goes around that. Again, he did many things. He was on the special commission. He convened that commission. He wrote scholarly articles. He wrote a defense of Monivite in 1969. He wrote an another one on the 10th year. He wrote a scholarly article. He was our man. All right, now this I have to pause for this. I'm going to go quickly through some things. But the Philippine bishops in 1990 apologized to the Catholic faithful for not teaching the church's teaching. This amazing passage is, he said, they say, it's said that when seeking ways of regulating births, only 5% five of, of you consult God. That's 5% five use, five use natural family planning. In the face of this unfortunate fact, we, your pastors, have been remiss. How few are there among you whom we have reached? There have been some couples eager to share their ex expertise and values on birth regulation with others. They did not receive adequate support from their priests. We did not give them due attention, believing then this ministry consisted merely of imparting a technique best left to married couples. Only recently have we discovered how, this is a beautiful sentence, only recently have we discovered how deep your yearning is for God to be present in your married lives. Again, the priests tend to think, seem to think, and the bishops are saying they thought about it themselves, you guys aren't up to the job of radical Christian witness, right? You're not up to the job of living your married life totally in accord with the church's teaching. And they weren't hearing the Catholic couple say, no, I want, I want to be holy, I want to be a saint, I want to do whatever it takes, right? The bishop said, we, weren't, we didn't hear that, we were missing that. He said, we did not know then how to help you discover God's presence and activity in your mission of Christian parenting. Afflicted with doubts about alternatives to contraceptive technology, we abandoned you to your confused and lonely consciences with a lame excuse, follow what your conscience tells you. How little we realized that it was our consciences that needed to be formed first. A greater concern would have led us to discover that religious hunger in you. Beautiful passages. We need apologies <laughs> uh, about the, the failure of the church to teach its church teaching and that how much we want to uh, make the sacrifices that are necessary to achieve holiness. The U.S. bishops did this incredible thing in 2012 when they fought the HHS mandate, 100%. It's got to be a miracle. 100% of bishops signed on to fight the mandate that was requiring everyone, every Catholic business to pay for contraception. The good news is that's our Sacred Heart Seminary in Detroit, one of the best in the world. Uh, great reform. I was brought in by Archbishop Vignon, who said, I want this to be a Humanae Vitae seminary. He said, I want every um, priest going out here, uh, seminary and leaving here, to be able to defend the church's teaching. Um, marvelous schools, this is Benedictine uh, College, amazing um, reform of that school, and they're producing unbelievably fantastic uh, young people. I was there for a conference a couple months ago. They had 60, they had breakout section, sections in which 60 people made presentations defending the church's teaching on contraception. Young people, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not one of the oldest people in the room, and it was beautiful. I mean, they were, they even advanced our understanding in some instances. They, they came to the middle, Benedictine College is in, really, the middle of nowhere, right? It takes two hours to get from somewhere to get to nowhere. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, these people came, you know, they basically paid their own way to give a 20-minute presentation on Humanae Vitae. I was incredibly edified and inspired by that. There's wonderful NFP groups, uh, new family life practices. I or NFP promotion groups. I was, spoke last night to the group that's setting up this Gianna healthcare program. There's a marvelous websites. This Natural Womanhood is one of the best. If anybody needs any information, place to go. 
our own Mary Hassan right here put together this incredible study uh, years ago on what Catholic women think about faith, conscience, and contraception. I try to put this out there whenever I can. This is from the excerpt of the press release. It said, highlights from the groundbreaking research include the finding that while only 13% of church-going Catholic women completely accept the church's teaching on family planning, I, I would have thought it was two or five, so I was, I'm kind of happy with, I'm not happy with 13, but I'm pleasantly surprised. 13% of church-going Catholic women completely accept the church's teachings. The acceptance doubles 27% among young women 18 to 34, and that's the group that uses contraception, who attend mass weekly. This, this, this blew my mind. It climbed still higher to 37% among women who both attend mass weekly and have been to confession within the past year. Who would think that 37% of 18 to 34 year old women, Catholic women, the one who go to church and practice the church teaching, accept it in a culture, in a church where they probably, they probably have been taught it. They've probably gone to focus groups. They've probably belonged, gone to the good universities. They've probably belonged to the different movements in the church who teach this. And when they're taught it, they live it, all right? And they accept it. There's, the secular world is now rejecting contraception. The New York Times had, well, not rejecting, but beginning to recognize the severe health, of, bad health side effects that come with contraception. New York Times had a whole series of articles. There's this book, Sweetening the Pill, uh, that uh, Ricky Lake is hoping to make a documentary about it. And there have been so many conferences. This was a great one at uh, Catholic U uh, a couple months ago, a fantastic academic conference. This one was in uh, California. I think they had about a, uh, nearly 1,000 attendees at this conference. New concerns, I'm just going to flip through this, but there's, in Rome, uh, major uh, Catholic theologians, priest theologians, are now questioning the church's teaching. Uh, one says that, this is Chiodi, um, he says that um, in some, he thinks Memoris Laetitia supports saying that in some circumstances require contraception. Um, another pontifical uh, theologian uh, says that uh, the term intrinsically was too restricting. My, that's hilarious headline, honestly. Um, and there's a book written, Amoris Laetitia, a, a, is it a new development in, in moral theology? So dissenters are now using Amoris Laetitia, rightly or wrongly, to challenge the church's teaching. All right, uh, I'm just going to, there's some people who are fighting back. Uh, Cart, um, Aquila uh, put out a beautiful document on Imani Vitae. He got ahead of the crowd. He put it out in February on the splendor of love. I have already done this. All right. All right. This is my last slide. All right. Someone gave me this poster a couple years ago. Pope Paul VI saying the pill is a no-no. All right. I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted that uh, this uh, archdiocese uh, has made this one of the uh, a major conference like this. I thought the prayer from Cordelione is extraordinary. Though I might have changed the word articulation, but that's okay. It's a, it's a, it's a magnificent, there's, there's no churchman uh, that has done more uh, to defend uh, Humani Vitae in this last year than Cordelione. About half the conferences I've, went, I've gone to, he's also uh, there. Uh, and of course, your own Shapu is uh, one of the leading <laughs> top five leading lights uh, in the church uh, today. And they're few and far between, I'm sorry to say, but those that are, are unbelievably uh, beautiful and they should have our eternal gratitude. So I thank you. Pornography is a tough subject to talk about, but it's time to be courageous and expose the truth so that we can seek healing as a culture. It is destructive, it is increasingly violent, and it is a worldwide problem. There are 4.2 million pornographic websites, and 80% of 15 to 17 year olds have had multiple exposures to hardcore porn. But this is not a problem that is out there and affects those people. 47% of Christians say that pornography 
is a problem in their home. It's time to bring solutions into the light. If you have struggled with pornography, you should know that there is hope. Breaking free from pornography use is possible. If you are dealing with a spouse's pornography use and you feel betrayed, your marriage can be healed. If you are in a leadership position in the church but don't know how to address this problem, there are resources to get you the training you need. The church's teaching on the harm and sinfulness of pornography is grounded in the greater yes or affirmation of the inviolable dignity of the human person revealed fully in Christ and the gift of human sexuality and marriage in God's plan. The greater yes to the Lord sheds light on the corresponding no to the darkness of sin, including injustice. In our duty as pastors and shepherds to proclaim Christ, we must state clearly that all pornography is immoral and harmful, and using pornography may lead to other sins, and possibly even crimes. Integrity Restore is helping pastors and shepherds, as well as parents, spouses, and all people in fighting the battle against pornography. Our mission is to help restore the integrity of individuals and families that have been affected by pornography by utilizing scientific, therapeutic, and Catholic theological approaches. Integrity Restored provides education, training, encouragement, and resources to break free from pornography, heal relationships, and to assist parents in navigating a culture that sexualizes youth. Pornography leads to unrealistic ideas about sex, the objectification of women, the sexualization of children, and broken families. But there is hope, effective, honest, accessible, spiritual, and scientific help is waiting for you. Integrity Restored, breaking the chains of pornography. Please join us by visiting our website, www.integrityrestored.com, and sign up for our mailing list.